Next up, we're uh, we have uh, Kathleen DeRose, who's uh, yeah, uh, yet another professor here at, uh, at at Stern, and is the director of the Fubon Center, whom, if you uh, which if you don't know, is actually the, the 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 organization that's running this conference. Thanks, Foster, and thanks to both of you. That was a very cool uh, talk about about innovators and, and and about innovation, and a fantastic segue into our next panel. So I'm Kathleen DeRose. I'm the director of the Fubon Center. I'm a finance professor at Stern. And I'm really thrilled to introduce the next panel and to hand it over to our panel moderator, Julie Diamond. And Julie is the assistant director of Endless Fund Frontier Lab at NYU Stern, which is our own incubator and accelerator for deep tech and life sciences. So perfect person to lead this, what sounds like an amazing panel uh, that we're gonna go into now. Please do post your questions in the WOVA app or uh, in the chat, and we'll take them up at the end of the uh, talk. Enjoy it. Great, thank you so much, Kathleen. And um, yeah, thank you uh, to the organizers of, of this fantastic event um, for inviting me to uh, moderate this discussion today. Um, yeah, so the theme of this conference is how breakthrough innovations are disrupting various industries. And we've certainly seen um, tremendous innov innovation when it comes to healthcare. Um, so for example, synthetic biology has really come to the forefront of cutting edge therapeutics uh, due to its ability to engineer new biological systems or to redesign existing ones. Um, an example of this is uh, messenger RNA, mRNA based treatments um, in which the body is stimulated to fight disease using its own mechanisms. Um, similarly, we've all heard uh, about CRISPR and how it's completely changed the limitations of science, um, you know, both as a novel treatment modality itself, uh, but also as an important tool for creating treatments. Um, so we're lucky today to be joined by two startup founders um, pioneering breakthrough tech within this space um, who are here to give us an inside look into how to uh, blaze a new path in healthcare. Um, Jacob B. Kraft uh, is the co-founder and CEO of Strand Therapeutics, um, which is commercializing an mRNA platform um, based on his research at MIT. Uh, we're also joined by Chen Hao Huang, uh, the co-founder and CEO of Algen Biotechnologies, which is leveraging the power of CRISPR uh, to identify novel drug targets um, and is a spin out of Jennifer Doudna's lab at UC Berkeley. Um, so I've had the pleasure of getting to know uh, Jake and Chen Hao through uh, NYU's Endless Frontier Labs um, mentorship program, um, and I'm thrilled to be speaking with them today. Um, yeah, so I guess, Jacob, uh, could you please introduce yourself uh, and your background and uh, Strand Therapeutics to the group, and then we'll, we'll turn the mic to Chen Hao for, for the same. Ah, um, so uh, hi everyone, and thanks for uh, having me here. Um, so uh, I'm I'm a I'm a scientist, right? My my whole goal, my entire life has been, how do we build drugs that don't just treat diseases in a chronic manner, but how do we cure them? Um, and I think the way that you cure diseases, you know, I, I think like 80% of all uh, non-infectious disease is linked to um, is linked to genetic disorders. And so in order to cure them, uh, in order to cure genetic disorders, you have to have genetic fixes. And so that's where gene therapy really comes in. The idea that you can take genes, synthetically make them in a lab and deliver them into a patient um, so that they go into the cells and actually are taken up and, and behave like the, the gene um, themselves. Uh, and the, that technology has been around for decades um, as we've been trying to translate it. Uh, it's been very difficult. Uh, a lot of times people, originally people used a lot of viruses and tried to engineer different types of viruses that have a number of issues such as like, you know, they elicit immune reactions because your immune system doesn't know uh, that the virus is trying to help you. Um, and so what the technology I was working on at MIT and, and now we're, we're developing at um, Strand is uh, the idea that we can take uh, messenger RNA, 
which is the message your DNA genome uses to send its genes out into your body in order to, to, be, um, to be created into the proteins that actually you're made up of. Um, we can actually just take messenger RNA as a molecule, synthetically create it and encode genes onto that molecule, and then deliver that molecule uh, as, a, uh, as a therapy that gets taken up into our bodies, creates the proteins that we encode inside of it, and ultimately cures diseases. Um, you know, this approach can also be adapted for things like vaccines. Um, anyone following the COVID vaccine race right now um, will see that uh, you know, the leaders such as Moderna and BioNTech in that race are, are both uh, messenger RNA uh, companies with a, a you know, very similar approach to the technology. Great, uh, Chen Hao? Sure, uh, thanks a lot, Julie, for the introduction. Uh, I'm Jun Hao, Elgin co-founder and CEO. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. And also would like to thank the invitation from Melissa and the Fubang Center. So I'm a genetic engineer and drug developer. Uh, I did my PhD at Well Cornell Medicine, Momo Sloan Catherine, under the guidance of Dr. Scarlo, uh, who is the pioneer in functional genomics technology and cancer biology. And during my PhD, I learned how cancer drivers regulated the 20,000 genes expression in our cells, in our body, and also started building technology to discover novel therapeutic strategy. And later on, I moved to UC Berkeley, did my postdoc under the guidance of uh, Professor Jennifer Donna, and started to merge CRISPR tools with machine learning to understand these complex disease gene networks and how we can actually reverse them back to normal. And later on, inspired by my two mentors who are great uh, scientific leaders and serial entrepreneurs, uh, I studied Algen with my founder, uh, with the mission to decode the disease functional gene networks for therapeutics discovery, and also to create a sustainable and digitalized biopharmaceutical industry. Thank you. Great, awesome. Yeah, so um, maybe we can talk a little bit about getting a medical breakthrough off the ground. Um, and, and this all starts usually with a problem. Um, you know, when you are a PhD student, maybe the problem is, well, we don't know why molecule A is signaling to molecule B. But um, as a, a business and a company, you have to look at the broader picture um, and, and what the unmet needs are um, in, in healthcare. And so uh, my first question is, you know, what problem were you trying to solve when you set off to build the technology that formed, um, you know, the basis of, of your companies. Um, and, and maybe we can, uh, we can start with Jake and, and, and go to Chen Hao and then, um, and then I'll try to get more, more exotic with uh, the order of answering questions <laughs> in a minute. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so what, what we were really trying to solve uh, both at MIT and, and now at Strand um, was the, the fundamental issue that the, the promise of gene therapy has existed since, you know, the, the clinical trials of the 90s that, that ended up having um, some pretty dire outcomes with um, toxicities and, and patient deaths that slowed the field down. But essentially, even after gene therapy came back, we're still hitting a number of roadblocks um, due to the scalability of treatments. Um, now with uh, approvals of treatments uh, like uh, the, the spinal muscular atrophy drug that Novartis got approved last year, um, you know, it's $2.1 million, most expensive drug ever created, uh, ever, ever marketed um, in the United States. Uh, and $2.1 million is, I mean, it's just not a scalable solution to anything, right? It's a rare disease The maybe, you know, payers, uh, health insurance providers will pick up that cost um, for the small population that it, that it is targeted to. Um, but, you know, in general, these, these gene therapies that are supposed to be for the masses just have failed to materialize. And so the, the idea was what technology can get us to the most amount of patients with manufacturing processes, production um, that is also scalable um, in, a, in a cost-effective manner. Um, and to us, that, that had to do with kind of 
picking messenger RNA as a, as a modality because uh, compared to viruses, it's much easier to produce, uh, much cheaper um, to, to produce and, and more scalable um, and why it's, you know, come out as the leader to produce the COVID vaccine for the, for the same reasons. Um, but outside of that, it was, well, well how, do we, how do we not just make messenger RNAs that like Moderna and BioNTech are doing, how do we how do we think about mRNA a little bit differently? You know, those companies were making mRNAs to encode genes. We wanted to make messenger RNAs that would actually go into the body, be able to sense the surrounding diseased environment and make a differential decision that you could encode all onto the, to the genetic structure itself. Um, and so we came from this field called synthetic biology. Um, it's a, a field that seeks to uh, utilize the programmable nature of, of uh, genes, essentially. You know, all the genes in your body aren't just on and off. They're, you know, turn on here, turn down to 50% here in presence of another gene. Um, highly complex regulatory networks like computer code. Um, and could we make drugs that operate in the same way? Um, and so that's what we started building technology for um, in the hopes that we would be able to make drugs that would be widely applicable to large patient uh, populations that would be able to reach a number of different people um, and, and could, uh, you know, really make a difference in the, you know, market landscape um, and be, you know, affordable enough to access by the, the majority of the population. Mm. Got it. Sure. And uh, yeah, at Elgin, there are two big problems we are solving uh, when to change the world. The first is for patients suffering from advanced cancers or neurodegenerative diseases, there's still no effective treatment or there's a treatment failures or relapse of the diseases. And so we still need a, a solution to solve this main need. And so that's why uh, at Elgin, we are trying to see whether we can develop a new way to understand the disease cells, and then we reverse what the, the, the key genetic disease drivers, uh, their functions. Mm -hmm. And the second problem we are solving is the current drug discovery process of uh, biopharmaceutical industry is very expensive, very risky, and still very time consuming. So for example, to get a drug candidate from target discovery to IND filing, uh, which means uh, be ready for clinical trials, it could take $20 million, six years to develop that, just a single one IND file drug. And even with that, it's still very risky. A lot of drug candidates can fail in the end in the clinical trials. Mm -hmm. So therefore at Elgin, we are making effort to, to, to see whether we can make this whole discovery process much more sustainable by using our technology. And, and also uh, one thing we're big on is to digitalize the, the whole process. Mm -hmm. And this we, we hope uh, can accelerate uh, the creation of the future like sustainable biopharma industry. Got it, got it. No, that's, that's great. And I think, um, you know, uh, in order for you to start tackling these problems that you, you set out to solve, um, you know, you, you needed to sort of make a plan for, for commercialization, right? And um, it's, it's not always easy to you know, take a technology that you find in academia or sort of under that setting and translate it and, and transform it into, um, you know, a fast growing business. And so what were some of those challenges that you faced, you know, bringing something from the lab, um, you know, and eventually to the market? Um, what, what hurdles stood out? Was it, you know, learning the business side of things? Was it, you know, not, yeah, what, what were sort of the first steps you had to take and, and what came up for you? I can let Chung Hao go uh, first. Yeah, let's, let's like. do it. Let's sure, yeah. it up. <laughs> getting crazy. Well, yeah, so uh, I have been scientist for like a long time and uh, the mindset we are trained is like, okay, we are driven by our curiosities to explore the biology and, and for myself, I, I really fall in love with gene regulation, how a complex uh, machinery, molecular machinery in, in our DNA level, we can regulate so many genes uh, like uh, uh, up and down, right? To, to regulate our cell, our body. And so we are driven by that. And then uh, not care that much about what's the outcome is purely like scientific uh, interest and, and curiosity. 
-hmm. And but when uh, I turn into like entrepreneur now at Algens, uh, uh, this definitely uh, uh, the scientific curiosity is definitely good because a lot of basic research in the end like generate create a whole new industry, right? Like CRISPR, mm -hmm. it's from the bacteria virus interaction, purely scientific research. And then, but, but uh, given my role now at Elgin, I started to shift to like a little bit more business mindset. So keep my scientific spirit and then bring in the business mindset, which means uh, we need, actually need to build something people want uh, to know your customers. And then, uh, 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 so that means we can uh, first evaluate the market, uh, the business need, and then trace back to what kind of technology uh, we can be able to solve the, the, the need uh, uh, people want, yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. Different mindset. <laughs> gotcha. I, I think, um, you know, it's a, it, the world of biotech in general is a, is a difficult place to navigate, especially as a, as a first time founder and as a, a scientist that's coming straight out of, uh, coming straight out of um, academia. Um, and I, th I think you have to be honest with yourself about what your role is going to be and, and how you how you perceive yourself in the company. So with, uh, you know, with with any sort of uh, startup, the the CEO and the leader of the company needs to be a communicator kind of first and foremost. I've heard, you know, some CEOs in, in deep tech and biotech uh, describe it as the, the chief education officer. Basically, your job is to teach other people about what you're doing, whether that's, you know, potential employees, whether that's the media, whether that's investors, um, you have to be a communicator. And that's not a skill that every scientist has. Um, but there are, you know, there are scientists who, who do have that skill. And so it's, it's always, I, I think I got very lucky um, because my, my co-founder and I worked together um, at MIT for a number of years. Um, and then we both had some experience in finance. He was an analyst at a hedge fund. I was uh, uh, working as a consultant with a couple of venture capital funds in, in Kendall Square in Boston. Um, and so we both had kind of both sides of the coin, um, but we were very honest with ourselves on where we thought our strengths lied. And my strengths are not in running a scientific team. Um, you know, I, I, I like to dream and have like crazy ideas, but I'm just not a, I'm just not a detail oriented person like that. Um, but he is, he's the most detail oriented person and he, he can really execute on scientific problems like that. Um, on the flip side of that, um, you know, it, it was, I think it was clear that in terms of communicating, especially with non-scientists or non-experts in the field, um, that I had a, a slight advantage there. And so we, you know, it, it just happened to, to work out in a, in a real partnership. You know, they say there's a reason that uh, all startups have co-founders and not founders. Um, because really it, it takes a team. Um, you know, I, I think it takes a team for a number of reasons. Um, you know, the, the early days of a, of a venture are, you know, just kind of crappy. Um, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, just for everyone, I mean, everyone knows you're going to hear no a hundred times before you hear yes, uh, for, the, for the most part, if, if you're, especially if you're a first time founder, especially if you're going to go into a complicated space like biotech, where some investors just don't even understand how to invest there. Um, you have to you have to really learn about the the art of storytelling, and also you have to just hear no a lot of times. And so it's it's helpful to have like a good co-founder, I think, um, there. Um, but yeah, I mean the the hardest the hardest part. I mean every day is a new hardest part. Um, I, I think when you're first starting out, you're first trying to think about how do I take this science project um, and turn it into a you know a, a multi-million or billion-dollar company eventually. Um, and so it's, uh, yeah, every day has a new challenge. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, I guess it never, never really ends in terms of, of challenges, but um, it seems like you both overcame sort of the, the early hurdles that, you know, could make or break the, the company as, you know, as an actual thing in existence. So, so congrats on, on, on that. And um, I guess, you know, you, you brought up a good point about um, uh, communication and communicating your vision and your technology to, investors um and this this will sort of be the last uh question having to do with the science itself i guess and we'll move more into you know the business aspects but you know at what 
point did you feel like the technology was ready to like go out and actually have those conversations with investors? Um, you know, was there a certain like value inflection point that you had to hit before you went out? And, you know, how long did it take? And how did you set that milestone? And um, maybe we could start with Jake, because it segued nicely. And then we'll see if Chen Hao has, has insights. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'll start off by saying that I made the wrong decision. Um, you know, I, I went out way too early. Um, and, and, and it wasn't really, uh, I think, in a, a matter of the, the technology itself. The technology itself was probably at the level that it could have gotten funded, you know, three, four years into my PhD, which was six years long. Um, and I founded the company uh, around like year five. Uh, and uh, we immediately wanted to go out and start to pitch people. I had been working in venture as a consultant while I was in grad school. And I had a number of contacts and I had a number of friends who had started companies who put me in touch with their um, venture, uh, uh, you know, their venture investors and their companies. Um, mm -hmm. And so we were able to get meetings. And I thought like, you know, if we can get meetings, it means we're ready. And like, you know, I think my network was stronger than my story um, because mm -hmm. I wasn't really ready to, to pitch them. I think technology is ready when the technology can tell a complete story. Mm -hmm. um, because everything, everything, everything in the world is storytelling. Like that's what humans, for whatever reason, care about. You can have the coolest technology in the world, but without a story, it doesn't matter. I, I think like, you know, it, the, last, uh, the last speaker before this was talking about Elon Musk. And I think, you know, SpaceX is, uh, you know, if Elon had come out and said, I want to make rockets that land themselves, people would be like, I mean, that's fine. Like, that's cool. I mean, you're Elon, you already did PayPal. So, you know, you're rich and you're doing Tesla. So we could, we could back you. But I think the story of I want to die on Mars and not on impact, which is what Elon used to say, is a much more powerful thing to, to hear. And it gets everyone behind the story, it gets employees and investors and the media and everyone kind of behind it. So I think the question isn't just about the technology. The technology is, is most likely read. If, if you've published it, if you've published it in a journal and it is going to be able to be translated into a, uh, uh, into a company in some way, then I think the te technology is ready. I mean, even if you have a draft of a paper, because papers take forever to get published, as everyone knows who's a scientist. So um, yeah, I mean, the, just when, can you, when, when is your story ready? When can you take people along the journey of this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it, and this is why it's a big deal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and in, your, in, in my case, uh, so basically I, I feel it's more like organic process with the investor and uh, because I, I, I'm fortunate to know like our current investor like Illumina one year before we start Elgin and mm -hmm. also the angel investor and, and at that moment I know I want to start a company but still uh, the timing is uh, haven't decided yet, right? So then uh, still keep doing research and building a technology in the lab. And so, so uh, but again, we, without this, uh, like uh, first to know this investor earlier, uh, it's probably uh, won't be ready when, when you actually want to start a company. So I, I think the relationship building is quite important. Mm -hmm. And also the other thing to actually allow us to feel we are ready is like, okay, we have a proof of concept of the technology and also the co-founders need to be also available at that time, everyone like on board, right? <laughs> So I'm ready, and, but again, uh, the co-founders, they, they uh, also have their own scene and need to be like a right timing. Everyone can like come together. Uh, so that's, that's uh, also very important. And especially for like a, a pre c and Jurong uh, uh, funding, uh, the team is very important. Uh, they, they usually believe if you have a great team, then you can probably build a, a lot of technology that, that's solving the problem. And but later on, when we raise our uh, seed round, then the, the bar will be getting, start getting higher. We need to show uh, proof of, uh, our platform, the, the prototype, we can find novel uh, targets for undrawable cancer. We need to validate the targets and then to show all this data uh, to the investor and uh, to be able to like say, okay, we can move to the next stage, right? Mm -hmm. And so like uh, each step, like the, the value inflection point is, is quite different. And I can imagine the next inflection point will be uh, you show the business tractions, all that. Yeah. Sure, sure. Totally. 
Um, it's a great point. And, and actually, I will use your last two words to parlay this into my next question. So business traction. And I, I do want to get into, you know, the investment landscape and, and more about VCs in a second. But so business traction. So, you know, you, you both have clearly innovated on the technology itself on, you know, um, pulling a team together that meshes well, like, Maybe we'll start with Chen Hao on this one because we we've you and I have actually talked a lot about you know Algin's business model and sure. and whatnot. So how do you innovate on the business model? So you you both Strand and Algin are both platform technologies. You have a lot of um, options actually for for a business model. You can you know develop. Um, in-house proprietary assets, leveraging your tech. You can work with other companies that want to, you know, push their own tech forward. Um, you know, what are what are the ways you can innovate in your business models? Sure, and yeah, as you know, besides like scientific innovation, I care a lot about business innovation. And yeah. so I, I do believe only we achieve these two type of innovation, then we can become a truly like sustainable company. Mm -hmm. And so one thing on the business innovation side, uh, we have been thinking a lot is like, uh, you also need to be benefit and help the whole ecosystem, right? For example, we are in biopharmaceutical industry. How can we make this uh, industry better than mm -hmm. that's, and also in the end, if we do B2B uh, uh, to like uh, biopharma, then they, you need to build something they need. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we start to thinking, okay, uh, as a platform security company, uh, what's the commercialization strategy for our drug candidate? Uh, so we do, did the, the deep calculation. For example, I just mentioned that to get a drug from target discovery to IND, you may need to spend, biopharma will need to spend at least like 19, 20 million dollars. And so that's why they are, uh, tend to like ac acquire some assets like drug candidate uh, using like around $20 million or, or $50 million because if they can directly acquire something you already proof, then they don't need to take that risk to do mm -hmm. that. And so if we are able to innovate this uh, pre-clinical value chain basically uh, to be able to make the drug discovery faster, uh, let's say from six years, now we can only but we just need one year. And also for the $20 million research budget, we can uh, just use like $5 million or even lower to achieve that. Then uh, definitely we, we can create a, 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 a huge business on this, right? Because whenever we develop one single new drug candidate, uh, they, we can get a, a, a prop like revenue from the biopharma and then they can get a good job to move forward. So that's on the drug candidate side uh, when we, uh, generate our, our own uh, uh, compounds. And on the platform side, we are more tend to like, okay, we can partner with Biopharma and also Cancer Foundation, Pediatric Foundation, uh, because they have the mission that they want to solve this disease. And a lot mm -hmm. of people are suffering that, so that's why they have this foundation. Mm -hmm. And we think our technology can yeah. partner with them at early day uh, to drive uh, the therapeutics they want. So. Uh, that's why, like, uh, we are big on these two type of commercialization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Jake, what what's the approach at Strand? Is it a, a dual approach as well, or something different? Yeah, I mean, I think the 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 big thing that we try to incorporate at Strand is to to always maintain a, a healthy amount of academic curiosity and. Um, you know, working in a platform like messenger RNA in the gene therapy space uh, gives us certain flexibilities for, uh, so, so for example, you know, if we were designing viruses as gene therapy vectors, it would take us about six to eight weeks at best from the design of a new, you know, a new drug to test out, or like if we wanted to tweak something in the, in the interior structure, take, a, take us about six to eight weeks to kind of realize that. Um, mm -hmm. At Strand, with the processes we've set up, um, we can do that in about one to two weeks. And, in, um, and with a new automation pipeline that we're building out um, in, in partnership with a, with a large uh, nonprofit organization, we are uh, going to get that timeline down to about four to five days um, in terms of our, our iterative ability. 
Um, and, and also, you know, being able to do things high throughput, automation allows us to do things high throughput, screen multiple different um, uh, uh, drug kind of mixtures. Because um, to, to me, it's, it's all about increasing the time. Biotech is a slow moving industry and that slow speed corresponds to higher costs of operation, which correspond to higher cost of drugs at the end of the day, which, uh, and, and it makes the entire thing kind of a gummed up process. And so if we can increase that iteration, if we can create more drugs in a shorter amount of time and get them out and test them faster than, than other sorts of, uh, of approaches, and we can build more drugs into our pipeline in you know, say a year and a half, two years, rather than five to six years, that savings can be passed on to you know the investors can still have a a profitable return while the savings still get passed on to the eventual consumer and we're able to get highly scalable drugs for large amounts of people mm -hmm. um and so i i think it's it's really about incorporating kind of these metrics of high throughput and and high intensity science um in, into the into the developmental process um mm -hmm. and this this idea that the company is always in a, you know eternal beta I think that's what Reed Hastings called Netflix. It's an eternal beta. They're constantly changing the way they operate things. They're constantly moving uh, different things at Netflix because they're never fully agreed on uh, you know, the final layout of what the company will be. And that's how they stay on an innovative edge. You know, I, feel the, I feel the same way about what we do at Strand, right? We, we make traditional, traditional gene therapies, um, but we also have other areas of our business that we're incorporating. We're starting to, you know, manufacture uh, certain things for other companies in order to access some revenue streams. We're mm -hmm. starting to, you know, interact in very creative uh, swapping business deals with other biotechs where we exchange certain pieces of IP that are useful to, to each of us. And it's not really a partnership. It's more of a, an exchange. So we can each move into new areas. Um, you know, I, I think those, those sort of creative uh, innovations and the, the ability to, or the, the want to be creative with the way that you're building a company is uh, uh, really where, you know, you can drive a lot of innovation into, into ventures like this. Wow. Wow. Really interesting. Yeah. So um, I guess it's, it's just innovation on all fronts. You, you both must be um, very busy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> working on this yeah so why don't we why don't we shift a little bit i think we have about you know 15 ish minutes um and i want to spend some time talking about the investment landscape uh for for breakthrough biotechnology companies like yourselves um you know and i think so far we've we've discussed that that development cycles in the life sciences are long and they're capital intensive um so, you know, what, what type of investors do you look for that understand these, these long development cycles? Like, do you have to just stick with investors that invest in life sciences? Have you ever, you know, worked with tech investors? Like, and, and what's the difference between the two? And um, what, are, what are your approaches with that? Um, is that one, is that question to me? Sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so we, we, we have both life science and, and kind of tech, deep tech crossover investors. I think there's, there's definitely a difference um, between like a, a tech investor that specializes in software and tech investors that like to get into deep tech sort of uh, innovation. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, one of our lead investors from a last, from a previous fundraising round, like, you know, we're one of a couple biotech companies that they've backed, like that are, that kind of have this technology, uh, uh, high throughput, innovative platform side, but they're also, you know, backing quantum computing companies and 3D printing rocket companies and all sorts of crazy ass things like that. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, I wanted to get in with a group that would understand that we need to invest in the platform in order to innovate. But we also brought in life science investors because we wanted people that understood drug development, that understood the competitive landscape, that understood how we interact in the market and could also offer us connections into areas of the life science industry that maybe we didn't, maybe I didn't have existing um, connections at the time. Um, and so kind of striking that, that balance and straddling those two worlds, kind of East meets West, um, sort of between the East Coast, heavy biotech, uh, life sci, um, to the West Coast, uh, more, uh, uh, you know, tech enabled sort of 
um, investments was a was a you know that was built by purpose in the way that we've built our our investor base. Um, as I look to the future, like a next round of financing, perhaps, right? Um, I'm I'm still interested in that sort of tech crossover, deep technology investors who have you know partners with PhDs and understand science but are willing to make deep investments in the idea of doing things differently, of actually disrupting biotech. I feel like a lot of biotech startups, especially here in the city of Boston, are, are less startups and they're more business development moves. It's more like an experienced set of executives got an amount of capital from a group of investors and they're gonna take some IP and they're gonna develop it and then they're gonna sell it off to someone else. And that's a great move. That's a great ability that, you know, provides value into the system, into the medical ecosystem, but it's not really a startup. I mean, it's a small company, um, it, but it's, it's not really a, a startup. It has fixed kind of pieces. It's not, uh, it, it's not trying to disrupt anything. It's trying to add value and capitalize on that value in a, in a more financial transaction with a scientific uh, twang. So, um, you know, I think when you're building real, true, new platform technologies and you're trying to literally disrupt how people think about, you know, uh, uh, innovation and, and biological innovation and drug development, then you need to have investors that have uh, experience and kind of the appetite or, or the, the, the gall to go after heavily set industries and just say, you know what? We're going to place a bet on the line to do things completely differently and let's see let's see what happens got it yeah and i, I totally echo what jack say like uh, yeah we are also like uh, getting like a uh, 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 different type of investor including platform investors and life science investor and and both their uh, experience and network are super helpful for the for the company like us, like a hybrid platform biotech companies. Mm -hmm. And just want to add on, uh, the other point is like, could be a different stage of the companies you can bring in like a different type of investor, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, at early days of a, a platform therapeutic company, uh, you are still building your platform. Then at that moment, uh, maybe you can bring in on like a platform investors, which can help you uh, to get your basis, uh, like a steady, and then when you start getting to like a drug development, you get into your uh, a preclinical study, you are ready to kind of move forward to a clinic assay, then uh, you can start bringing like life science investors. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, this is also the other uh, way to do it. And also we start to see like uh, in, in this space, some people also like do a different company structure, like you have a a platform company uh, on the top and then you can spin out your assets uh, into like a new entity and then yeah. you can have a platform investor for the platform side and then you have a life science VCs uh, mm. on the, the, the new entity which you have a, a strong like a chemistry and, and clinical team to move forward. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a lot of like uh, new things going on in the, in the field. Yeah. 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 Got it. It's yeah, it's, it's really interesting. It's um, you know, you have, Sort of a lot of options, but again, it, it sort of sounds like the the timing at which you bring certain types of um, investor partners in, you know, sort of sort of matters and will help um, as you're you're building your business. Um, great. So, uh, last couple of questions here, just trying to stick to the the theme a little bit of of innovation, um, and you know it you both probably have a, a pretty solid finger on the pulse of what's new in biotech and what's cool and um, would love both of your takes on, you know, what are some emerging technologies in healthcare that you find particularly exciting other than your own companies because we will keep it uh, unbiased, but um, what's, what's new and cool out there and uh, what are you excited by? Uh, maybe we could start with Jake. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, my biggest kind of hope for, for medicine, what I think is the most exciting outside of what we're doing at Strand, um, is the continual incorporation of artificial intelligence and machine learning into biology. Um, you know, I, I think there are so many places where, where AI and, and ML can innovate in the space. And it's not just in drug discovery, like companies like Atomwise, 
um, uh, are, are a great example of AI being, uh, being uh, applied to drug discovery. And I, I, I think that's a, that's a fantastic company with a great CEO. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, also there are companies outside of there that are leveraging AI in the uh, design of drugs in order to, to create better screening platforms actually in animals. Right. There's a uh, there's a, a new company called Manifold Bio that our uh, you know our lead investor actually just backed um, recently, uh, and I think that they are doing this fantastic work of using artificial intelligence to actually screen drugs um, in animals, which is the really most expensive part of of testing things. Uh, but they're using AI in order to to screen drugs more, in a more efficient way. Uh, that's going to you know, that could revolutionize the way that we, we look at drugs there. And I think AI in the design of drugs, especially uh, gene therapies. And, um, you know, it's something that I've looked at for, for Strand and we have, you know, uh, uh, pushes to move into that area. But, you know, the artificial intelligence is, is coming for all sectors, including science. Um, but I, I think it's going to lead to us being more efficient um, and, and creating better, more advanced drugs uh, quicker. Mm hmm yeah, and uh, besides Elgin, uh, the other company I, I feel excited about in the biotech field, uh, especially for those which uh, is providing an infrastructure and also like a more efficient workflow for uh, actually the biotech stops, right? So for example, there's a benchling now allow us to like design our vectors and then everyday lab node, all that can, can be like a u uniform on the platform. And there's optimized what Jake mentioned, they, actually can help with a new startup to design their own drug. And there's a Ginkgo BioWork, uh, which uh, help the, 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 the new startup also can, not just big biopharma, also the, the young startup can get benefit from them by uh, getting like a lot of efficient, uh, uh, different type of sales. So in the end, you can see there's the other wave that uh, the startup is helping startup. So mm -hmm. that's more like an ecosystem. Uh, uh, improvement, then uh, you can see like the biotech wave will come like uh, accelerate a lot uh, through this uh, ecosystem. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Great. All right. So for, for my last question, in the spirit of startups helping startups, um, would love for each of you to give one piece of advice to a budding healthcare entrepreneur that that hopefully is on the line and is, is relevant too, uh, but I think there is. Um, so Chen Hao, let's start with you and, and we'll end with Jake. Sure, uh, so definitely uh, yeah, if you are founders, find the North Star you have and then just be persistent on that because you will face so many failures uh, on the way, but as long as you have your North Star, you probably uh, will keep going, right? And, uh, and also if you are not failing, Failing that much, that means you are not innovating enough. So I think, yeah, be persistent on that. And the other two pieces of advice is like, uh, probably you can find a way to see whether you can forecast the, the technology future a little bit more. So for example, uh, in my case, uh, I believe that like uh, artificial intelligence will be merging with biotech and that's the way we can digitalize uh, all the information in our body, right? So it's just the timing when that will merge together. So uh, then you can start to like connecting different dots of technology and people to build the, the, the business. So uh, yeah, that's my uh, piece of <laughs> advice. Great. Um, I think don't be afraid to be the evangelist of your science, um, I, I think. Uh, and, and don't be afraid to, to you know, try leading the, the charge forward. I think at biotech, uh, especially if you go and talk to a lot of biotech investors, uh, traditional kind of old stick in the mud biotech investors who can't really get on the new wave of things, um, you know, they're going to say things that are super um, besmirching and condescending to you um, all the time. Uh, and you're just going to have to uh, be okay with that, right? They're going to say things like, okay, so what are your feelings on hiring a real executive team? Um, on a first meeting, upon first meeting you, they'll, they'll say things like that, um, which is not, uh, an, uh, you know, I, I think the idea that every single scientist can lead, you know, a large company and grow with it is also not, not true. I just think that there's a knee-jerk reaction among biotech investors 
to, um, to, to not want to have to chaperone or mentor their companies at all and really just deploy capital. And so for that, they rather have kind of these bigger, older executive teams. Um, they like the C-suite to be old, uh, you know, uh, old white men. That's pretty much what they're looking for. Um, so, and as a future old white man, uh, I'd like to say that younger people of all genders and races can absolutely lead companies, um, but you'll have to build a team around yourself, both in the company and as advisors. Um, older people, people who have recently done it, um, and, and I think just don't be afraid to, to try to build it yourself. Um, and if you can get people to believe in you and, and, and come behind you, then, um, you know, can continue to to be the the evangelist of your technology. Mm -hmm. This is my un, it's my underlying belief that founders are like technical founders, people who have created the technology and then want to bring it forward are the ones who are so emotionally invested in this technology that they're going to do absolutely everything they can to see this translated into the world mm -hmm. um, and, and to, to make sure that, that, it, that it's carried forward. Whereas, you know, a professional executive team, they might be there for the year and when stuff gets hard, if they have an opportunity to flip it off on some deal or, you know, just cut and run and shut the company down, they're going to have 20 other offers to go be, you know, another executive in another place. And I think we lose a lot of technology that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you both so much. This was um, really, really interesting. We're, we're going to uh, turn it over to the Q&A um, and I will pass the mic back to Kathleen DeRose. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, and if anyone has questions, uh, just drop them into the Q&A box. Super. Thanks, Julie. Uh, thanks, thanks, guys. Very, very, very cool and interesting panel. And we, we do have some interesting questions teed up for you guys. So uh, firstly, from JS, kind of along the lines of what was just discussed about uh, financing long shots. Do you guys see any trends uh, for investors to move away from the more developed phase three type of assets and towards the earlier stage and more risky types of investments in stage one and two? What are you seeing there? Yeah, I mean, the entire field is moving to, or especially in on, uh, uh, immuno-oncology is, is one area where we've seen like this get so incredibly hot, uh, you know, not even like move to phase one, but actual preclinical drugs. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, Dragonfly Therapeutics, uh, MIT spin out from, from Tyler Jacks at the Koch Institute, um, struck a deal with Bristol Myers Squibb for uh, around $500 million in near term, uh, near term payments, yet they uh, have not gone into clinical trials. Like, I mean, they're, they're a preclinical company. Um, so, you know, we, we see those deals coming earlier and earlier for, for companies, I think, because there's a, there is a feeling that there is a wave of new technologies coming and, and pharmas are wanting to get in. Um, on the flip side of that, I think it's actually increased the early stage financing options for companies because uh, investors are seeing that there are buyers for earlier stage assets have shifted their focus to, all right, how do I get upstream of that inflection now? How do I deploy capital in a way that gets me to an early stage investment? Whereas before a lot of biotech investors might have been you know, at the preclinical to early stage clinical stage and deploying their capital at that stage. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I think all, overall it's good. I think that uh, a, a over frothy market can poison promising science though. I think if you have uh, pharmaceutical companies throwing money at non-clinically proven, throwing just buckets of capital at non-clinically proven uh, scientific ideas, that is how you tee up a number of high profile failures, which causes a massive receding of opportunity from the market. And then you'll lose a, a lot of promising science that just didn't get its day in the sun because too many high profile kind of hype objects uh, you know, stole the attention and then petered out. Yeah, so now yeah. you want to pick up on that? Is there like a crowding out effect going on there? Is there hype or is it for real? <laughs> uh, sure. I think I, I echo what Jack say. And um, but to add on, uh, if a pharma they pay like they, they get in early, they pay like less upfront payment, right? In general, because it's risky, and uh, and so they can have more leverage. So uh, definitely, I mean, there's a trend is like going that way. And also, I think the strategy on the operation side. What they are doing is like, okay, they try to engage you earlier so they can start have a conversation to know your progress about your drug candidate uh, at the preclinical stage. And then they can 
continuously uh, jump in when they want. So that's the way uh, I see they, they, so they start to engage uh, the, the, the early conversations and then they can choose the best time to, to come in uh, and make the, the, the good deals, yeah. Cool, there's an, another interesting question from the audience and uh, the question is, any thoughts on which companies or technologies will get us through the pandemic? So I, I think that's more than an, about the long shot vaccine and more broadly a question about, about technology that could help us out. Thoughts on that? I mean, I'm biased because I believe in messenger RNA and messenger RNA is leading the vaccine approaches. But I think that the other side that, that doesn't get nearly the amount of attention that it should and where we should look to develop technologies for, for future pandemics or, or this pandemic as well are more rapid testing capabilities. Um, rapid testing capabilities and antibody kind of uh, uh, antibody titer tests that are reliable would be two pieces of technology that could you know, really help us get back to a, a better way of life, right? If everyone had a, a handheld, easy, um, you know, test that they could just take a, at a rapid point of use and scan it in to some system, you know, twice, three times a week, that would change a lot of the problems that we're seeing, I think, at, uh, at, at universities right now and at schools. Um, if we had antibody tests that we don't know exactly what the antibody titer rates mean in terms of ongoing immunity to COVID, um, but if we could show like who's been asymptomatic and has recovered and has an ongoing uh, uh, immunity, we could just answer a lot more questions about whether or not that gives a protective immunity. We could do large scale studies over multiple months of people who test positive for the antibodies and don't end up getting a follow on infection. And if that's different than the general infectivity rate of the population, then you can pull that out and say, well, you know, we're, you know, there is a protective antibody. Now everyone who has positive antibody titers above a certain level is now, uh, you know, you can go out and be in public with less kind of a, a care. I think those two pieces are just information that we, we don't have. The, the problem with COVID has just been the latency period of the virus is so long and the asymptomatic rate is so problematic um, that you end, up, uh, you end up with this uh, lack of information which leads to viral spread, especially among people who are being inconsiderate with the way that they use their mask or attend large gatherings and such. So, you know, I think the virus is going to be great to, to or the, not the virus, the, the vaccine, excuse me. The vaccine is going to be great to, um, to, to, you know, finally put a, put a stopper on all of this. But honestly, if we had more information on this uh, via testing on, on both those fronts, we could get out of a lot of the issues in, in terms of the way that it has impacted the population. So, do you want to add to that? Because are, are there any companies sure. or technologies that you're aware of that, you know, could really advance our, our help in this area? Yeah, I, I think my short answer for this question is we need all type of biotech company to uh, work together to, to, to solve the pandemic, right? So uh, definitely we need grab vaccine and then uh, also like uh, drug, some drug development in case like uh, they're, they're still need uh, uh, in some cases. And also uh, on, the, on the software side, uh, there could be definitely uh, uh, more like a big data analyze, like what's the, the infections and, and what's the the, 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 the peoples get infected, all, all that, right? And also definitely the rapid detection. So, and the cool thing in, and very encouraging is like uh, in the past few months and also like my time in uh, Endless Frontier Labs, we do see like uh, now like a lot of biotech company that actually try to use their expertise, their core technology to be able to adapt to solve this pandemic problem. And then you start to see like a, a, a lot of new innovations comes out uh, together. So uh, yeah, that's what I see. And I, I think it's quite encouraging so far, yeah. That, very good. There's another, uh, with several sort of questions around more about being an entrepreneur in, in life sciences. And the question is for you guys, very credentialed, um, lots of opportunities. What made you decide to go the startup route, co-found your own company versus, you know, joining something that was already successful, bigger company, something more developed. Go ahead, Jung Hao. You've, uh, I've taken <laughs> I'll let you, I'll let you. Uh, I feel, again, it's like pretty organic. Uh, yeah, I didn't get into like industry job. Uh, and also, okay, I, I think uh, the, the mindset is like, I have been seeing like my mentors, they, they start companies and also the, people in the labs, uh, like young graduate student, very talented, 
they also started uh, the, the company based on uh, their inventions, right? So that's why uh, it's like uh, uh, the environment actually uh, uh, make a lot of difference there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think I just have a, have a problem with, uh, uh, you know, not just doing whatever I want. Um, so um, I, it, it's a little facetious of it. I, I mean, I, I think that I had a, a, I have a vision of how the biotech industry can do better for everyone. Um, and there's definitely companies out there with those same pushes. Um, I don't know if there was people who met exactly what I was doing and I happened to be in a space and developing technology also that I was very close to and, and very, you know, is uh, it, part of my PhD thesis. I spent over a, half a decade with it. Um, and I realized that if I didn't take that technology and move it forward, it wasn't going to get moved forward. We talked to some of the other big mRNA companies about adapting the technology into their platform, but you know, it, it, it kind of, it, it doesn't really make sense for them to even use that tech because of all the investments they've made in, in their kind of uh, uh, angle and how they use it. And so what we ended up, what I ended up doing was saying, well, I think this is different. This is going to fundamentally change how we can develop drugs in this space. Um, but none of you really have a use for it. The only way it comes forward and the only way it gets deployed in a way that, that will, will change kind of uh, some of the things I, I want to be different in the biotech industry is to move it forward myself. Kind of, you know, no one else wants to see it as much as you do when it's your technology. And there's, there's that, 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 yeah, really interesting answers, you guys. There's another uh, sort of series of questions along the, uh, seems like it's a, uh, a prevalent concern or fear in, in terms of funding long shots in, in the biotechnology industry around just the cash burn rates and the pressure to, to sell to in like a big pharmaceutical company. How do you guys uh, weigh that pressure and how do you handle it day to day? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 please. Yeah, this, this like a tough question. Uh, of course, the yeah, we, we need to keep our cash flow and make sure that the company is not running out of money, right? And uh, and and also, I, I think that that's actually the CEO's job. You need to get money for for the company to make sure uh, you can keep going. And uh, I would say we are still not there yet regarding like. Uh, that stage, or oh, we need to like uh, concern about like be acquired or uh, uh, like uh, run out of cash. But uh, still, uh, I think. Well, the the the. Let me see. Yeah. So, but this pressure, they the, they always be there, right? You need to have a budgeting like what next year, what's the the, the technology you can build, and and the, the new people hiring. So. But I think, yeah, the, the best way to do it is to get there for fundraising and then uh, then you won't be like too worried about this, yeah. <laughs> Maybe, yeah I, go ahead. Well, I mean, I don't know if, if I would say that there's a, there's a pressure to, to sell out. I mean, not if you, not if you have the right investors. Um, you know, certain investors, yeah, maybe if they're getting to the end of their fund and they really want an exit to, to get them to the next step within their investments, maybe they'll uh, pressure you kind of to, to close out. But um, I think what's important is that the, the change that I spoke about in the pharmaceutical industry and the, the way that partnerships are happening now um, is that the, the farmers aren't nearly as gung-ho about buying early stage companies like this because they understand that like, they don't have any of the infrastructure to do the early stage development and manufacturing of these drugs like, like our companies do. What they do have is the ability to take those drugs and diligently develop them inside of, cl inside of clinical trials and combine them with other drugs and the capital that they can put behind that and the regulatory people that they can put behind that. Um, and so I think that they see that as an opportunity to Tr form true partnerships. And so, yeah, I mean, there are, there's pressure to find partners, I, I guess. But the other, the other thing is like, if you're in a hot enough space, which I think both, um, you know, both Chung Hao and my companies are both in that you don't really have trouble finding venture capital either. It becomes just an economic decision of, do I want to give up a piece of my company for venture capital based on whatever valuation I can get? Or do I want to give up a piece of the upside of this drug by partnering it with a with a partner and you run like some financial calculations and some pros and cons lists of what everyone brings to the table but 
um, you know, at the, <laughs> at the end of the day, like it's really just to me about getting these drugs out to patients. And if we get them out to patients, everyone should have plenty of money. So, you know, be happy. Plenty to go around. What, a, yeah. what an amazing and uplifting point to, to end this wonderful panel. Yeah. You guys have been amazing. I'm going to hand it back to, uh, to Julie to close it out and just want to thank you all for, for participating. It was fantastic. Thank you for having thank us. You.